Hi, and welcome to today's Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation Disease Education Webinar. My name is Dave Lederer. I'm a pulmonologist and senior medical advisor for the foundation. Uh, today's topic is sorting through advanced directives. What do I need to have in order? Uh, and with me today is Kathy Lindell, who's a nurse, a respiratory nurse, and associate professor of medicine in the Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine as part of the Simmons Center for Interstitial Lung Disease, which is a Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation care center. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you for the kind inv invitation, David, and kind introduction. So um, thank you to everyone who is participating today. Uh, we'd like to make this as uh, informal as possible and answer the questions that many of you have. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, reveal my disclosures. I currently have a, um, uh, I'm feder a federally funded investigator with a, a grant through the National Institute of Nursing Research, uh, and I also have a, a small grant from the uh, Three Lakes Partners, which is a private foundation. So our object our objectives for today, why is this topic important? We want to talk also about National Healthcare Decision Day, decision makers and the legacy that they provide, important papers, and resources. So why is this important? Why do we even have this conversation? So we know that pulmonary fibrosis is a serious illness. The disease course is unpredictable. Patients report progressive shortness of breath, cough, fatigue, and are frequently scared of the unknown. Patients often have comorbidities. That just means that they have other diseases alongside their pulmonary fibrosis, like heart disease, emphysema or COPD, cancer, uh, and other diseases. These diseases cause the patients to have even greater symptom burden. We know that as the disease progresses, patients experience worsening symptom burden. And sometimes patients will experience what are called acute ex exacerbations. These are time points when the disease progresses and the patient has a worsening of pulmonary fibrosis. What we know with that is that often there is disease progression, but it, it doesn't ever return back to the previous norm for the patient. So this next slide shows, it's pretty busy, and I apologize that, but we're going to walk through this. So these are potential disease courses that patients with pulmonary fibrosis can experience. So if you take a look across the bottom, there's an arrow that goes to the right, and that's time, and that's what we call the x-axis. So that's going across in years. And then if you take a look on the left side, there's an arrow that goes down that's called disease progression. Now, this um, is reprinted with permission of the American Thoracic Society, but this work was done by several leaders in the pulmonary fibrosis world, Brett Lay, Hal Collard, Talmadge King. So if you take a look, now let's go back to the left side and go to the top. So there's the onset of the disease, there's the onset of symptoms, there's the diagnosis of the disease, and then eventually there's death that results as, uh, you know, as a result of the disease. And if you take a look across at these lines that are going towards the right and down, there are many potential disease courses that patients with pulmonary fibrosis experience. And so we have had some patients that have the onset of disease, and they may be dead within one year. And then this next line that goes uh, uh, down, and it, it, you see it has like step-like jags in it, and it has, it has stars to highlight it. Those are what are, we consider acute exacerbations. The patient is kind of like just cruising along, and then all of a sudden they become very symptomatic, their disease worsens, and they have a decline. And then they, uh, sometimes they will recover and they'll continue to progress along, kind of like just, you know, cruising along again, and then they might have another 
uh, exacerbation and, and have a decline. And that patient in that second um, arrow uh, dies at three years. And then you take a look at the one, there's patients that may have the disease six years or even longer. The, the key to this slide is to understand that this is what we feel are like potential disease courses. Everyone's story is different and everyone doesn't follow exactly along the disease course. And it's really very difficult for your physician to predict when this will happen for you. So, this is where we think that it's really important that you just like, you know, be prepared for the worst, but hope for the best and do everything you can to achieve your best quality of life. So this next slide, planning for the future, we're going to talk about advanced care planning. So these, this slide comes with advice from Dr. Diane Meyer. She is a doctor that is at the Center to Advance Palliative Care at Mount Sinai in New York City. And so this is how she describes advanced care planning. It's the process of asking you what is most important in the event of future serious illness or loss of ability to make your own decisions. So the important thing that I want to point out here, this isn't just for patients with pulmonary fibrosis, this is for everyone. This is for caregivers. This is for providers. We all need to do this. We all need to think that as time moves forward, what is it that we want? So conversations about advanced care planning allow you to think about what you want when you get sicker. It, you state your values, your goals, your preferences for future medical care, and you prepare for medical decision making. And advanced care planning often is focused on completing paper forms, including the documentation of the healthcare proxy, and we will define that in a few slides, and the wishes in an advanced directive. So the advanced directive is the paper form that you are in charge of describing what is it that you want as time goes on. So few of us are comfortable about talking about death, whether it's our own or a loved one. It's scary. It's sometimes even taboo for many. But the end of life, no matter how long and how well lived, can bring a sense of loss and sadness. Thinking about the end of life is a reminder of our own mortality. So we may avoid even thinking about death. That's normal, but death is normal too. All of us will face it at some point. Now, this information is on this website through, uh, it's on the NIHseniorhealth.gov. And if you're interested, you can go to that website and get additional information. So when we talk with our patients here, we have considerations that we walk the patients through. And th some questions to prompt, um, you know, thinking about this in decision making is, what do I want for myself? If I'm unable to make decisions for myself, do I have someone to make decisions for me? More importantly, do they know they are my decision maker? Do they know what I value and what I want? Another question is, do I want to be admitted to the ICU, which is the intensive care unit, and put on a breathing machine with a tube down my throat to breathe for me? There's no right or wrong answer to this, but we just really want you to, to prompt you to think about this. What are your wishes? Do I want to be at home? Do I want to be in a hospice setting surrounded by my family and friends? Do I want to be in the hospital? Again, no right or wrong decisions, but these are things to think about. And then do I have any special requests? Do I want to be an organ donor? Do I want to have an autopsy for research? Do I want to donate my body to science? We'll talk about these things. So next week is National Healthcare Decision Day, April 16th. This occurs every year. And NHDD is an initiative of the Conversation Project. And the whole goal of this project is to inspire, educate, and empower the public and providers about the importance of advanced care planning. 
there are simple, free, and uniform tools available on their website that help to guide the process, and it's available across all 50 states in the United States. So that here is the web address, www.nhdd.org. So selecting someone to act on your behalf, behalf. We, we talked about this in saying we would, we would address this in a few slides. So the person who you choose to make your health care decisions is known by different names in different states. It could be a health care agent. It could be called a proxy. It could be called a representative, an attorney in fact, a surrogate, or even a patient advocate. So you're going to start to hear me as we go through these slides saying that it's individual in your state. So it's important to know when you're preparing what is necessary and what happens in your or required in your own individual state. So when you pick someone to act on your behalf, is, it should be, is this someone you trust with your life? And they would be able to act on your wishes and separate their, his or her own feelings from yours and act on your behalf. They live close by or could travel to be at your side if needed. They will talk with you now about sensitive issues and will listen to your wishes. Um, often family members will say, I try to bring this up, and they're like, let's not talk about this now. I don't want to talk about it. But it is really important that you talk about it now. And it's an important gift uh, to give your loved ones, and it's also part of the legacy of you sharing your wishes with them and them being able to carry out your wishes. Um, this person, uh, will they likely be available long into the future? Things to consider when you pick this person. Uh, would they be able to handle conflicting opinions between family members, friends, and medical personnel? They really need to step out to really be the leader for your, on your behalf. And can they be a strong advocate in the face of an unresponsive doctor or institution? I know that sounds hard. You wouldn't think that would happen, but unfortunately sometimes that does happen. So you want somebody who is going to really stand up for you. This information is from the American Bar Association, and if you um, want, you can visit their um, website and find more information on this topic. So this slide here, we want to walk through this. So when I was preparing to give this talk, I um, talked to the social workers at our institution, and they shared this document with me. And this document is different per state. So this is for the state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So who can make healthcare decisions when you cannot? So there's this ranking. And if you look on the right side, you'll see first ranking class of healthcare representatives. And then second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So when you cannot make a decision, the person who is the first ranking to make the decision on your behalf is your spouse. And then any adult children, but they're not of your spouse. So this would be a scenario, say you've remarried, and so um, it has to be your original um, you know, uh, children. And then the next, if there isn't a spouse, all other adult children. And then the third ranking would be parents. And then down the line, adult brothers and sisters, adult grandchildren. And then sixth ranking would be other adults who know your preferences and values, including but not limited to religious and moral beliefs. So in regards to this, what's the takeaway message for you is that you um, need to check within your state. And if there's a social worker or the nurse in the practice that you're seeing or your physician, um, you should talk to them about what are the rules in your state for um, who makes the health care decisions. And I can tell you what happens is that our social workers told me that they follow this. This is like the letter of the law in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure that's the same in other, other states too. So um, the important papers, I'm sure you... Some patients come back and they will tell us stories that 
even at their first visit when they come to see us, that their local doctor said, you really need to go and you need to get your papers in order. And so these are these important papers. And these are just a few examples of more common advanced directives. So the first one I'd like to talk about is the handicap parking placard. So this is technically not an advanced directive, but it is really very important. And then, we'll, so we'll talk about that in a, uh, in a minute. Then five wishes is another uh, example of a common advanced directive your state advance directive, and then the POST form, and we'll go through each of these. So the disability parking placard. This is an example of, um, on the left-hand side is the form that's required in Pennsylvania. On the right-hand side is the placard that's available in, or provided in Wisconsin. I was trying to not make this Pennsylvania-centric, um, so trying to reach out. But the reason that I personally think that this is a really important uh, way to enter into advanced directives is pulmonary fibrosis is a serious illness. You know that the symptoms that you experience. And this is easy to obtain. You get the form um, from either your hospital provider or you go to your Department of Motor Vehicles. And you bring this form to your physician and they fill this out, and then you take it to your Department of Motor Vehicles, and that starts the process for you to be able to get this handicap, handicap placard. So now, why is that important? So as I mentioned, you are already, pulmonary fibrosis is serious. You have a lot of symptom burden. I am a huge advocate that you save your energy for the good stuff. So this is the time to get the placard and park closest to where you want to go. So I really don't encourage that you spend all your energy trying to get where you're going, and then when you're in there, you're out of breath or you're exhausted. This is the time. Save your energy for the good stuff and use this so that you can enjoy the good stuff. So our next advanced directive is five wishes. So this is an example of what Five Wishes looks like, and the website, fivewishes.org, can provide you with more information. This is written in user-friendly user lay language. This was the first advanced directive to address personal, emotional, and spiritual issues in addition to meeting medical and legal criteria. And often this is provided in, in institutions. The next uh, advanced directive example is a state advanced health directive. So this is the example of the health directive that we use in Pennsylvania. And as you can see, it's, it's a form and it's several pages and you walk through it, but it's actually written very in like very easy to understand language. And you have to have um, a uh, witness sign it. And you share this with your provider. Now, if you live in another state, these directives are available through your state's Department of Health. So as I explained, this is the one that we use in Pennsylvania, but it's available in um, each state through the health department. So this other advanced directive that I mentioned was the POLST. So this is uh, P-O-L-S-T. Some states call it M-O-L-S-T but it stands for the Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. And these forms are completed by your health care provider after discussing what is important to you, your diagnosis, what is likely to happen in the future, and what your treatment options are. So a doctor, sometimes a physician assistant or nurse practitioner, depending upon the state that you live in, they must sign the POST form for it to be valid. And the goal of the POST is to effectively, effectively communicate the wishes of serious ill patients to have or limit medical treatment as they move from one care setting to another. So, for example, a patient moves, uh, is hospitalized, and then moves to a rehab facility to have continued care. So this form would go along with the patient and, uh, sh you know, share what the patient wishes are. 
So it also gives medical orders to emergency personnel, so your um, EMS providers, paramedics, EMTs, based upon your current medical situation. So pulse forms and advanced directives are both advanced care plans, but they are not the same. And so that might sound a little confusing, but we're going to go into, we're going to dig a little deeper, and I'll show you that in two slides or three slides. I want to show you an example of what a pulse form looks like. So this is the form for Pennsylvania, and you notice it's hot pink. And so that is a state required dictate in Pennsylvania. So each state has a different rule for what colors there should be. So you want to become familiar with this. And you can ask at your doctor's office when you see them. But if you take a look, this is the top half of the form. So, uh, you know, it has your name on it. Uh, then it has here uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So it's broken down into A, B, C, and D. And the doctor or your uh, nurse practitioner or PA will walk through this with you. So do you want to have cardiopulmonary resuscitation? That is when the patient has no pulse and is not breathing. So it, you are in charge of what is it that you want. Yes, I want to have everything done. I want to have this attempted. No, I do not allow a natural death. Then medical interventions such as uh, comfort measures only, uh, limited additional interventions, uh, full treatment. Uh, then as you see at the bottom, antibiotics, are, are artificially administered hydration and nutrition. And then the next slide is the continuation of the form. So I, we had talked about, about the antibiotics and the artificially administered hydration. And then at the bottom is the summary of the goals, the medical condition, and the signatures. So this is discussed with an E. This is where, you know, it's the patient, the patient of the minor, the healthcare agent. Uh, one of those needs to be selected. And then the goals of care. And then at the bottom, it's signed and um, dated by the provider uh, who has the conversation with you. Now, here is a little more information on, so the Pulse form, and this is from the POST organization. So as you'll see up in the upper left corner, www.post.org. And I have to tell you, if you're confused, please don't be worried. I was a little confused when I was going through this too. And so I had, had to go through this a few times. So this is a breakdown. If you take a look in the first column, the type of document, who completes it, who should have one, what it communicates, and can this appoint a surrogate decision maker. So the first, the second column then is the Pulse paradigm form. The third is advanced directive. That's those state forms and uh, the five wishes. So what the difference is between a Pulse paradigm or the Pulse form and an advanced directive is that the Pulse form is a medical order signed by a physician. The advanced directive is a legal document. So who completes the Pulse form is a healthcare professional, as we mentioned, the doctor, the nurse practitioner, the PA. The advanced directive is completed by the individual, the patient. So who should have one? So for the Pulse, anyone that is seriously ill or frail, regardless of age, whose healthcare professional wouldn't be surprised if he or she died in the year. And then how does that compare to the advanced directive? That, who should have one? All competent adults. So what do these documents communicate? So the POST is a specific medical order, and the advanced directive is general treatment wishes. And can this document appoint a surrogate decision maker? The POST is no. That is the conversation between you and your provider, whereas the advanced directive Yes, you can say, I want so-and-so to intervene on my behalf. So this form continues on the next page. So the surrogate decision maker role. So for the post form, the, uh, the surrogate can engage in decision and update or void the form if the patient lacks the capacity. Now, if for the, the third or that third column for the advanced directive, 
the surrogate decision maker cannot complete the advanced directive. This needs to have been done beforehand. So the next question is, can the emergency personnel follow this document? Yes, the post form, as long as it's seen, the EMS should follow the document. In regards to the advanced directive, no, they don't follow that. Now, the ease in locating these forms. So for the pulse, the patient has a copy, a copy is in the patient's medical record, and it may even be in a state registry if the state has one. So the advanced directive, there is no set location. So the individual, the patient, must be sure that the surrogate, their decision maker, has the most recent version. And then periodic review. So the post form, the healthcare professional responsible for reviewing with the patient uh, or surrogate should do that periodically. In comparison to the advanced directive, the patient is responsible for periodically reviewing. So as I said, if you're a little confused, please don't worry, this next slide should help us. So how do, does an advanced directive and a post form work together? So let's start at the upper left corner and work our way down. And this, again, all, all of this in, information is available on the PULST website, www.pulse.org. So we feel that all adults should complete an advanced directive. That means that they select someone that will act on their behalf when they can't make their decisions on their own and will honor their wishes. They should update the advanced directive periodically. Now, what is important to know is this is not set in stone. So just because you do it once doesn't mean that you have to stick with that. If you have a change of heart and you decide you want something different, you need to update the forms. So, and that is totally, you know, feasible to do. So all adults uh, diagnosed with any advanced illness or frailty at any age should also um, have this um, uh, advanced directive. Now, when, I actually missed said that, when someone is diagnosed with advanced illness or frailty, that's when they, uh, a pulse form should be completed. And then update the pulse form as the health status changes. And the whole goal is that the treatment wishes are honored. Now, I want to bring out an important point here. So how this works in relationship to a patient that has pulmonary fibrosis. So if you go back, or you remember we talked about the slide, the slide with the disease course is variable. So our, you know, we cannot predict how the disease will advance. So it is really important that you have these, these discussions and these forms in place. And for someone who has pulmonary fibrosis, it's probably important that you also have a pulse form and have that decision because there, if you have an acute exacerbation, you can have a rapid decline. So it's important to have these uh, forms and uh, have them in place. So some additional uh, resources that are available. Um, so this website is really a very nice website. It's the Prepare for Your Care. It was developed by Dr. Rebecca Sidori in San Francisco at the university there. And the website address is on the bottom, uh, www.prepareforyourcare.org. And this is a step-by-step -step program. It has video stories and there's different scenarios in there. And this helps you to have a voice in your medical care and talk with your doctors and also as we mentioned before, it gives your family and your friends peace of mind because what happens is you go through this and you decide what's really important to you and you're also able to share that with your decision makers. And then you print a summary of your wishes and you can also fill out an easy to read advanced directive. So this is a, an excellent resource to be aware of and utilize. We mentioned earlier about um, the conversation project, and this is how the National Healthcare Decision Day has come about. So this project is dedicated to helping people talk about their wishes for end-of-life care. 
We know that no guide and no single conversation can cover all of the decisions that you and your family may face. What a conversation can do, though, is provide a shared understanding of what matters most to you and your loved ones. This can make it easier to make decisions when the time comes. And if you're interested in more um, information about this, if you go to their website, they, are, they have starter kits to help you with this conversation. Now, here's an example uh, of uh, something that's available in the state of Washington, and this is for um, EMS providers. This is uh, it's called the Vial of Life, and your um, you complete your advanced directive and you put it in this vial, and this vial you keep in your refrigerator. And so the EMS providers know that if they're called to a house, that they look in the refrigerator to see um, what you know, if this is there and it, it will, you know, guide them on the care that the patient wants at this stage. Another excellent resource is from the National Institute of Aging. It's called the Age Page, Getting Your Affairs in Order. And the, um, if you Google this website or you go to this website, you can get uh, additional information. They tell a story of two different patients. And one is a story of a patient who wasn't prepared, and his spouse was left to find all the papers which were scattered throughout the house. And so it really made the spouse's um, role at a, a tense time even more challenging. And they compare the story to another patient who had everything and how that the loved one, when it came time, knew what the patient wanted and was able to, you know, spend the time, uh, you know, with the end of life wishes for the patient. So the suggestions from the National Institute of Aging are that you put all of your important papers and copies of legal documents in one place. You tell a trusted family member or friend where you put all of these papers. Uh, you discuss your end of life preferences with your doctor. And then you give permission in advance for your doctor or lawyer to talk with your caregiver as needed. So this um, should help, you know, this is a very helpful guide with this information. So donating your body to science. Uh, patients frequently will ask this question. Um, we have a program here at our institution where patients donate their organs or they're able to at, you know, shortly after the time of their death to help, you know, researchers learn more. But um, to donate your body to science, this differs state per state. So here's um, one example. This is called the Human Humanity Gifts Registry. So how do you find out information? Uh, you actually go to your state. Uh, you go to Google and you state, um, how do I donate my body to science in your, whatever state you live in. So this is in Pennsylvania. So this is the Humanity Gifts Registry, and it's a nonprofit agency of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that's concerned primarily with the receipt and distribution of bodies donated to all medical and dental schools in the state for teaching purposes. And the registry in Pennsylvania was formerly called the Anatomical Board, but it's been in existence since 1883. And there is a form on this website that helps to guide you to do this. Um, now, people will say, well, geez, if I donate my body to science, what exactly does that mean? So in this scenario, what happens is that your body is donated and medical students or dental students can actually learn about human anatomy. Uh, and disease pathology by using this body after death. And so it's very helpful for patients. And um, I'm going to ask Dr. or Dave Letter at the end to um, talk about his experience, but I want to go through another one uh, first. So here's an example in Florida. So in Florida, it's called the Anatomical Board of the State of Florida. 
And so this is a nonprofit state organization that's responsible for receiving, preparing, storing, and distributing donations of human cadavers used in medical education and research programs throughout the state. And so this board distributes the bodies to universities and colleges that have these programs. And so what I learned when I researched this is that these are nonprofit institutions and there's no cost to the patient to donate your body. Uh, and so there's no cost to the institutions to receive this. I've learned that there are also companies out, that, out there that are for profit. And so there's no charge to the patient to donate their body, but they in turn then charge the institutions um, for your body parts. And I talked with one of our hospital administrators today, and he said, yes, he said, I'm very familiar with that. He said, an orthopedic doctor might want a hand um, to, you know, just practice on. And so they would have to pay for that part. So that's the difference. It's important if you're interested in this to know what's important. Do you want to donate to a non, uh, not-for-profit or a for-profit where they would sell your body parts? We're going to just review before we open it up to questions. So this, we saw this slide earlier. So the review of the consideration. So what is it that I want for myself? If I'm unable to make decisions, do I have someone to make decisions for me? Do they know they're my decision maker? Do they know what I want and value? Do I want to be admitted to an ICU intensive care unit and put on a breathing tube uh, with a tube down my throat to breathe for me? Do I want to be at home? Do I want to be in a hospice? Do I want to be surrounded by family and friends? Do I want to have everything done in a hospital? These are all questions that it's important to you to be able to, um, you know, express your wishes. And then the special requests. Uh, do I want to be an organ donor? Do I want to have an autopsy? Do I want to donate my um, bodies for, or you know, my body for um, research? Um, so with that. Uh, we'll turn it over to David for the questions and answers. But before we do that, uh, Dave, I was wondering, could you um, talk a little bit about your experience with uh, in New York when patients donate their body for science? Sure. Um, first, Kathy, that was um, that was really fantastic. Thanks for going through all of that for us. Uh, and to our listeners, if you want, you can type in some questions in the question box on your screen uh, and uh, we'll bring it up and discuss it. So in New York, as far as I know, um, the only way to donate one's body to research is through specific medical centers. Um, I think many medical centers have set up programs where people can register um, for, for that uh, for that. Um, I'm not aware of, at least hasn't come up in my experience, of there being either nonprofit or for-profit organizations in New York State where I practice, um, but I, I may just not be knowledgeable about them. Uh, and I do, you know, certainly I, I think it's great if people want to help us understand pulmonary fibrosis and, and donate their lungs, for example. Um, I will say two things about it. One is uh, we certainly really want everyone to sign up to be an organ donor. So if you're, you know, you and your family and loved ones and friends, if you haven't signed up to be an organ donor, uh, please uh, find out how to do that in your state. Uh, in some states it's very, very easy. In other states it's a little more complicated. Um, so I certainly encourage you to do that. Um, and that, that doesn't mean that research couldn't be done. For example, um, when, uh, there, when someone does become an organ donor, and what I mean by that is when someone has uh, passed away uh, in an intensive care unit on life support and they or their their designated loved ones have um, you know decided to to you to um, offer their organs for donation um, that during that process when the family members are being talked to so when the loved ones are being dis are having the discussion with the organ donation team at that time, at least in New York, you can say, you know, I want my loved one's organs to be used for research if they can't be used for donation. Um, and in addition, there may be research 
that could be done on those tissues, for example, on the kidney, for example, um, if they're not used for research. Um, so, so that even is an option, even during the organ donation process, at least in, in New York, um, that certainly is. So we have, we have a question, um, and I'm, I'm going to start with this one, Kathy. Why, why have both a pulsed and an advanced directive if the advanced directive won't be followed if you have a pulsed? Is that, is that clear, Kathy? Should I rephrase that? No, it is clear, and I actually, that's a really good question because I struggled with that too when I was, like, um, you know, preparing this. So um, the, what I take away from it is if we go back to this slide, and I'm going to go backwards to this slide to guide us. So the pulsed is considered when you're, um, your, your illness is very serious and the doctor thinks that you might have less than a year to live. But uh, what happens with the pulse is it has to be signed by the physician. So, and we know that in IPF, we can't, as I mentioned, we can't predict. Uh, so that's why it might be important to do this earlier in the time course of the disease. But the advanced directive, the advanced directive like leads the conversation with your decision makers so that they know what you want when you can't make that decision. If, and let's use the example, suppose that you're just going along fine with your pulmonary fibrosis and everything is going great and you were going to get to this, I'll get, like most of us, I'll get to it someday, I'll get to it someday, but then all of a sudden you have an exacerbation and you go downhill and then you can't make any decisions. So the advanced directive helps your person who you want to be your decision maker guide the conversation with the provider if you're in the hospital. I hope, does that make sense? Dave, do you want to add yeah. anything to that? No, no, I think that was, that was perfect. Uh, so we, we do have a couple, couple more questions. Um, this is an interesting one, uh, important one. What if you don't want your family to make your medical decisions uh, and what if you want a close friend or an advocate can can they legally override your family yes yes but you have to have that um, that's a time where you probably would want to um, see an attorney uh, and just have that um, you know written out and you know notarized um, uh, but that is completely possible. And, and I can give, a, a, like, actually uh, a story, and I won't give, divulge any information, but I, I know somebody who was hesitant to get married, and then he found out that his, he's an adult child, that the loved one who he'd lived with in a common law relationship for years, if something happened to him, he was in a car accident, that his parents would still make the decision. And that actually led him to get married, so that his significant other could make the decision. Yeah, I think uh, it is it is always complicated. I think your advice to to involve a lawyer in that kind of situation is really important. Um, you know, certainly, and and certainly, sometimes, uh, as you were saying, and as of many of us have experienced, sometimes these decisions are are decisions that need to be made quickly, right? Within sometimes minutes, but yeah. Uh, you know, hours, uh, you know, can't wait a day or two. So having all of that squared away um, is really important. And, and, you know, I think most circumstances you don't need a lawyer, right? I mean, these the healthcare proxy is very simple to fill out. But I think you're right. If, the, if it's a unique situation, if you're bypassing family members, for example, I, I do think getting legal input is, is important. Um, the next question is, um, I can answer this one if that's okay. Yes. May a per person donate just one of their organs to science? Um, and the, the answer is probably yes. Um, certainly you can, for example, for organ donation for transplant, you can certainly say I only want to donate my kidney or my lung or something else. Um, for, for research, I think if it really depends on the organization that's coordinating the organ donation for research. Um, so, and each each organization, whether it's a medical school or some other 
uh, organization probably has their own specific requirements or uh, rules about what can and can't be donated. But I think I, I would imagine in most circumstances that uh, that, that would be perfectly appropriate. Uh, Kathy, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, you, that, that's exactly what I think too. So I'm just scrolling through these. So we have a really important comment here about organ donation from one of our listeners who said that uh, when her husband passed, they were asked about organ donation, but because he had IPF um, and some other medical problems, we thought it was a, quote, dumb question. However, his corneas were donated, and two people see today because of that. So that's a really good point, which I think I, I, I didn't say uh, at all, which is that just because you have a medical condition that you think is very serious, it doesn't mean that um, some type of organ or tissue donation is impossible. So I, I think it is important that if you are so inclined, and I would encourage everyone uh, to consider signing up as an organ donor, even if you have a medical problem that you, you think might mean you couldn't be a donor, because ultimately the decision is up to doctors and, and other people in the organ donation system. And in, in this person's case, um, you know, they were able to donate their corneas, and how wonderful is that, right? So, so ne don't ever think that you're, you're not able to donate. You, you may be able to donate. Okay, this is a, an interesting question, and Kathy, uh, either you or I, I think, could, could answer this. Um, this is, what, what happens after someone's body is donated to science? That is, it's been donated and, and has gone through a process uh, where uh, tissues or organs have been used for research, um, what what happens? And I, I think the answer is that um, the same thing that would happen in any other circumstance, which is that um, the family decides what to do and, and have a service or funeral or burial or cremation. Um, I think there are, um, you know, circumstances where there are, you know, very minimal use, as you know, maybe just donating the lungs to, to science. Um, but again, I guess that also depends on what uh, uh, what what the specific institution is and, and what the arrangement is. Kathy, do you have any experience with that? I do. It's so interesting. I learned more about that today um, when I was looking into this. So um, some people will donate their body. Um, they, they said it's actually, you know, um, it, it was interesting, the things that I were reading. It, like It's like romantically felt that. I'm doing a really good thing, and that's, they use the word romantically, and it's very altruistic. Uh, sometimes it's also because of a, a scenario where it's expenses, uh, and people just don't have the money. Uh, so it's free to donate um, to uh, your, um, you know, your body, and what happens is at some time, at, say at these medical schools, what they will do is they'll actually have a um, the body gets cremated after they're done with all the use and then they will have a ceremony uh, at the um, the medical schools they will um, inform the family member if they want to come so and there's no expense for any of this so it was kind of like that was more of a like a like a realistic approach to donation for someone if they wanted to do that but what I read was they don't get you don't get the body back for your own um, you know funeral ritual and that when you donate it to science. Great, thank you for that, Kathy. Um, okay, so uh, I think uh, that's all the questions we have. Uh, Kathy, I want to thank you so much for a really fantastic webinar. That would, um, I think I, I myself learned a few things. And uh, I hope we can have you back in the future for another webinar. So thank you so much. Um, and then uh, I also want to thank uh, Lindsay Bassett from PFF, who does a lot of the behind-the-scenes work, uh, all of you for listening. And uh, I also want to thank Genentech and Beringer Engelheim, uh, two companies that help support this webinar series through uh, their grants. So thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll see you, I think, in June. In June, uh, we are going to hold a, quote, Ask a Doc webinar. We're going to have three doctors uh, on the webinar and invite you to ask uh, lots of questions. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. So thanks, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.